an arts hero. I am an arts hero. I'm 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 an arts hero. I am an arts hero. Welcome to the 2024 Connecticut Arts Awards. Our theme this year is the work of art framing the future. In a culture and a society that's filled with division, with hatred, and with contention, we know that art as a part of the central human experience can help heal and help us imagine and reimagine what the world can look like. Tonight is focused on you. We wanna celebrate Connecticut. We wanna celebrate our arts ecosystem and the wonderful people that make it so vibrant and wonderful. What you're going to experience tonight is centered around this idea of honor. We're gonna be honoring nine Arts Heroes awardees who have been selected by members of the community. And we're also introducing a brand new award this year called the Emerging Creative Award. So buckle up for an experience and a journey through the narrative that is what happened in 2023 in our arts community. So let's celebrate each other, let's love each other, and most of all, let's have fun and kick off this new year together. Please welcome to the stage the Director of the Office of the Arts, Liz Shapiro. challenge. I never go anywhere alone. I always bring a friend. So um, hi, everybody. I never know what I'm going to say when I come out here because I look out and I've had this last hour of welcoming you all into this building, into this space, um, into our Connecticut Arts Awards. And I'm just kind of blown away by the magic that is you. Um, if you had the pleasure of looking around, if you got even if you got here just in the nick of time, and we love people who get here just in the nick of time, it's kind of our, our, our normal thing, um, you will notice that there's all different kinds of people here. And that, I think, is one of the things that is so beautiful about the arts in Connecticut. What you are is a microcosm of what we are as a state. And I am really proud um, to be the head of the Connecticut Office of the Arts, to have the most amazing staff, most of whom you've met tonight or you've met in the past, and they have worked so hard to bring this event to you tonight, I basically just take instructions. Um, I am really proud, though, to be in the Department of Economic and Community Development. The DECD, I think, is actually the perfect place to house the Office of the Arts because the arts are about identity. The, uh, the arts are about vibrant communities. The arts are about making sure our kids have pathways to learning that are not necessarily the direct line that works for every student. The arts are about engagement, civic engagement. The arts are about improved health outcomes. The arts are about improved housing outcomes. The arts are about a healthy and holistic community of Connecticut, and I am really proud um, to be working with my colleagues in DECD, many of whom are here tonight. It is, right? Yeah. Um, I am really pleased tonight because I am going to have the pleasure of, this is the first time that I have been able to introduce um, the brand almost new commissioner of the Department of Economic and Community Development, um, Dan O'Keefe, who, who is, he's my partner in crime as we come out on the stage because I, I, as I said, I always bring a, I bring a friend. Um, the thing that is so cool about Dan and my colleagues in the DECD is that the arts, um, historic preservation, the humanities, museums, conversation, and the way we serve the entire state of Connecticut in terms of business development, in terms of all the, all the work that we do in DCD, and it is a lot, all work together to make things better for the community that is Connecticut. So I think we're in the perfect place. I think it's the perfect time, and I am really proud to introduce Dan O'Keefe. Thank 
you so much, Liz. So first, I, I do want to just thank Liz and the entire staff uh, in, our, in the arts group within the DECD. <clears throat> they worked tirelessly to pull off this event. When I asked Liz about it, she said, you know, uh, our staff uses this as an opportunity to get pretty dressed up. So I put on the tux, and I also want to thank Liz for the opportunity to put on my fancy pants. Uh, so what I, what I thought I would talk a little bit about is, is um, why I think you know, the arts are so important to our, our past, our present, and our future. You know, the last couple of years, coming out of the pandemic no one wanted, we've seen a pretty interesting change in the trajectory of our state. We've seen tens of thousands of new residents come into the state. Massachusetts is losing people, New York is losing people, Connecticut is gaining people. Last year we were the number one state in the country, uh, one of, of all 50, where uh, for Gen Z movers, Gen Z, these are young families choosing when given an option of where to live. With more flexibility of where to live, they're choosing to live in Connecticut. And when you think about the reasons why might, that might be, you know, I think it really does come down to the quality of life here. You know, the quality of the experience in Connecticut and the quality of our culture is supported by the arts. You know, it's an incredibly important part of why people choose Connecticut. And so I just want to say tonight from the DECD, from myself personally, you know, congratulations to all of our honorees. You truly are arts heroes. Thank you so much. And um, I, I never like, you know, you never talk after your boss. It's always a bad policy, so I'm sorry. Um, but just in case you're wondering about this slide, we will be having a special guest here tonight. So you may have guessed who it is. But um, just hold that thought, and we'll be welcoming him when he gets here. He may be the busiest person in the state of Connecticut. Okay, on with the show. Make some noise if you're ready to celebrate. Oh, come on, one more time. Are you ready to celebrate? We're here to celebrate the arts. We're here to celebrate our arts heroes. And what you're going to experience now is really a look inside the hearts and the minds of our awardees. So sit back, relax, take it in, see yourself in them, and know that when we're all together, we are better. My name is Marcella Monk Flink, and I am the executive director of Monk Youth Jazz and Steam Collective, Inc. And I'm also the owner of the Monk Center for Academic Enrichment and Performing Arts. The reason I do the work I do is because as a little girl, I grew up in a home filled with music. And I always loved music. I sang my first solo in church at four. I thought I could play piano as well as sing. I really could not play piano. But I sang and I sang my little heart out and I always wanted to sing with the adults in our church and my father wanted to make sure that I had an opportunity to perform. And so he formed a family group and so my sisters and I, we began singing together. We still sing together over 50 years later. Um, we're a multi-generational choir. I love children, I'm a retired teacher. And because I love the arts, I would have loved to have been a music teacher. Um, I taught in the Talented and Gifted program, which was a close second. But I just love to give children opportunities to express themselves artistically. Um, and I, I think that's what motivates me, my love for children, my love for the arts, my love for music. I'm inspired by my parents their love for young people and their dedication to young people in the community. Inspired by my cousin Thelonious Monk and his genius. Inspired by my husband and my children and just all the children, all the beautiful people that God has placed in my life. I just love to see people smile and I see music as a unifying force. And so that's what inspires me, the ability to see people smile and to express themselves and to bring people together. Wow, being a hero means that I have an obligation to 
continue to do work that empowers others, uh, that encourages others, that enables young people who are coming after me to grow and to develop into heroes themselves. It's, it's humbling because I don't see myself in that vein, but I know that the work I do is important and the love that I try to share is important. So being a hero means being a, a lover of people and a lover of the future and trying to ensure that the future is brighter than today. And the world is better than I, better when I leave it, than I found it. My dream for arts in Connecticut and the world is that every person who wakes up with a song in their heart, who wakes up with a, a work of art in their mind, um, has an opportunity to express it. My go-to is always a song. I can find a song in the darkest hours. Um, a song will just lift me, will empower me, will encourage me, will take me through whatever. I can hear my mother singing. I can hear the women in my church singing as a little girl. I can hear the songs that we sang as little girls. And those songs, the songs that I've taught children, um, the songs that I've, I've rendered as an adult, a song will, will fix whatever ails me. And this is what Arts Hero Awards is all about. And now our special guest has arrived. We want to thank our governor for taking the time to spend with us Thank him for being an advocate for the arts, for being a leader, and for being a voice in the community. And so at this time, we'd like you to put your hands together and welcome to the stage our governor, Ned Lamont. I love Colonius Monk and what music meant to her. Um, when I was a kid, I played a little piano, and then it was keyboard, then we had a band, we called ourselves the Flower Pot. <laughs> I was 14, cut me a little slack. Uh, and I can tell you that, uh, you know, 50 years later, what she said in terms of um, the piece that the music uh, gives you sometimes, the inspiration, it's um, a lot cheaper than a therapist and just as therapeutic. And um, I played a lot of piano. We got about eight songs. You hear them a lot. Um, you know, especially during those long, quiet times uh, during COVID. And um, then as we came out of that tough time, um, you know, we realized how important you know, music and the arts were uh, to our kids and uh, helping them get back in the game and helping um, them be at peace with themselves and uh, get together with others. And uh, working, I hope, with many of you, we got um, a lot of the summer camps going, got access to all the museums, access to concerts, trying to do everything we can. Thank you for that. Thank you for what you do. Um, and. Uh, help our kids get back on their feet. And hopefully that made uh, an enormous difference. I, I think that uh, a lot of that music was going on outside, a lot of the arts are outside, a lot of uh, what they used to call graffiti I see is outside. And I think it has people rediscovering what they love about this state. And um, as you maybe heard from uh, Liz and, and Dan, you know, we've had more visitors to the state of Connecticut um, than ever before. And uh, I think they love what they see. Uh, I love 
the music in the schools. I love the arts in the schools. You gotta keep the A in STEM. Uh, keep the A in STEM. I think, um, you know, some kids throw a tight spiral. Some can do really good multiplication and division. Um, some learn to paint a picture or, or um, play a violin and make it sing. And anything that inspires a kid, they fall, they fall in love with, they're good at, they fall in love with, it inspires them for the rest of their life. And I think that's what the arts do for an awful lot of kids. And we need a lot more of the arts to um, keep that. And I'll say one other thing for all the STEM people out there. Um, <laughs> Uh, um, two of my favorite um, biographies are um, S Stephen Jobs and uh, Albert Einstein. And you say, okay, what the hell do they have in common? What does that have to do with the arts? Um, Stephen Jobs, uh, he did not take computer science. Uh, he took calligraphy. He studied calligraphy. So when all those other computer guys were looking at the screen, he looked at it in a very different way. And you got the interfaces, now you got emojis, and he brought that screen to life in a way that made it just a little more connective. And uh, Albert Einstein, okay, what does he have to do with the arts? Well, everybody else back there in Austria was learning physics the exact same way. They're all studying the same thing. They're all looking at life through that narrow lens. Albert Einstein played violin. He played violin for hours every day. And I think it was somewhat liberating, according to his biographer. He thought in a different way. He thought in a more open way. It expanded his horizons, and he expanded how we interpreted physics and what that meant. And I think that's what the arts does. We sometimes forget that in this very um, you know, industrial day and age, that uh, we need those dreams. We need those hopes. We need to allow young people to think bigger and old people to think bigger. I know something about that. And um, so from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank each and every one of the honorees. You deserve it. I know you're making a difference. I know a lot of you work in the schools, just like you heard from Ms. Monk, inspiring these kids, helping them to sing a song, and to helping them to uh, be all that they can be. That's what the arts is all about. Nice to see you all. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>
that were not given a chance to use their voice. And I said, well, I'll let you, you know, come with me and uh, we'll create together. And that's what I did. And, uh, I, and then I created uh, the Beat Laureate program. And I have laureates from all over the world. Uh, Greece, Sweden, Germany, uh, England, Canada, Mexico, I mean, all, all over. So, um, during the COVID lockdown, I, I couldn't have live events. So I started having Zoom events and that's when it went, it blew out, you know, internationally. People were asking, I want to be on your Zoom. And I was never given a chance to have my voice heard. And that's what I'm here for. I can't, I can't do this uh, without all the artists. You know? And most of my uh, beat laureates, even though they're writers and poets, they're also musicians and you know, artists of other types. Uh, very creative people. When we have all this environmental uh, catastrophes, you know, surrounding us, or political upheaval in the country, what can you do um, when you feel helpless? You can write, you can write about it. You can speak it uh, with your poetry. And then you can connect with other people. And believe it or not, that does change. Uh, it creates a movement of change, positive change. Uh, that's my goal, you know, to give everyone a voice and create positive change in the world. I'm a hero because I'm surrounded or I, um, welcomed all these other people, all these other creative people, and they uplift me. I guess that's what makes me a hero. You're not alone. You're not alone. Everyone feels like that at some time or another. And uh, to not be silent and not stay to yourself. Instead, reach out and you'll find that people are very, uh, they're not, you know, you might be afraid to talk to them, but they're very welcoming. Uh, yeah, it's not as bad as people think. You know? And you can have different opinions and people get together and they, they still, you know, they, they become friends. They have different opinions, but they get along. You know, there's never enough uh, expression. People, uh, especially young children, uh, they feel like they have nowhere to turn. Uh, so I would like to connect more with the younger people. My name is Dubia Montoya. I'm from Norwalk, Connecticut. I live in Eastern, Eastern Connecticut, but uh, I, I run an art organization in Norwalk called the Norwalk Art Space. I'm also uh, a painter, artist, muralist in Fairfield County, and I've also helped to find two other organizations called the St. Phillips Artist Guild in Norwalk and the Artist Collective of Westport. I feel like I, I have a lot to say and I might not be the best vocally or to, to say what I, I'm thinking. So I use art as a, as a vessel for me to express my feelings and 
being an artist in Fairfield County in Connecticut, I always felt that we lacked community. And so that's where I've always pushed myself to find community and help organizations, help community to build around the arts. Um, and so I have a passion to, to bring other like-minded individuals together and unify around the arts. World events, social events, um, issues of the day. I'm a person that believes in, in love and, and the power of understanding others. And that's where I, I, I try to express it through my art. And I'm a believer in that. And, and so I think that's where the community aspect comes from as well, is I want to help unify us through art. And art is that powerful gateway for us to unify around because it's it, it, you're visually taking it in and sort of starting conversations without being so heavy-handed with words and words could really divide us at sometimes I mean I started the North Art Space in 2021 and it was sort of right after COVID or we're coming out of COVID. And so our openings were a great place for the community to unify once again after being isolated for so long. So our openings were consistent of three to 400 people, you know, and that people were craving to be together again. And art was that unifying factor. Nork Art Space also gives free art education. And kids nowadays really need the arts to be able to find themselves, to be able to express who they are, find the confidence in who they are, so they go out into the world a more confident and more empowered individual to, to help change the world. <laughs> What I do is making a difference. I just being acknowledged um, for the work, for the love of what I'm doing. I love people. I love what I do as an artist. And if, I guess being acknowledged just makes me feel honored that people are seeing it and that it's making a difference. I've been watching art transform people for many years. And Connecticut's been a, a great place to push the arts and make arts a center of community. I, I've seen it in our classrooms where we do give free art education, give kids that confidence to go out, to stand in front of a room and be more impactful uh, and I feel like Connecticut does empower more artists through through the funding that they provide in Connecticut and I think they're 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 one of the top states that give to the arts and I hope that continues to to be the case because I, I, I believe in the power of the arts and what it could bring to a community the way it could unify community and different cultures. And we're, we're in a time where we need that more and more. And now, the reason that we're all here is to celebrate the arts. And we want it tonight to be salt and peppered with a little bit of music. And so at this time, we want to welcome to the stage the Dwayne Keith Project.
noise for the Dwayne Keith Project. We'll be back for more a little bit later. One more time, Dwayne Keith Project. And feel free, anytime there's music, you got permission to move. Don't be afraid to move. We're here to celebrate, we're here to have a good time. So let's dive back into the hearts and minds of our arts heroes, thinking about where they've been, where they're going, and where they hope we go. So let's enjoy it together. My name is Austin Scalzo, and I grew up in Wallingford, Connecticut. I've been spending the past nine or 10 years in Danbury. And I'm a bluegrass musician, mostly known as a fiddle player and a singer in a couple of regional bands, On the Trail and Rock Hearts. I'm a songwriter, an artist, and also a music educator. I went to school for music education at Western Connecticut State, and uh, I've always had a passion for education. And so recently, after teaching in the public school systems for four years, I quit that job to pursue sort of a bigger dream of mine that had been boiling during the pandemic, which was to kind of combine these loves of uh, bluegrass music and my passion and background in music education. So that's when the Connecticut Bluegrass Association started, which is uh, something that I founded uh, right after the pandemic when I quit that job. And that's been the focus of most of my work recently. When I left my job in public education, I had a dream. And uh, that dream was to be, to find a way to combine these, these two loves of mine. And most of that dream has been inspired by my heroes, the people in my life who have been mentors to me and who have inspired me. Namely, the, the biggest three are Jay Unger, and Christian Howes, and Pete Wernick. These are, all, these are all educators and performers. They're known for both their music and just being community-minded um, educators as well. They, they've created these, these places that have built my love for the music that are mostly, you know, retreats for musicians and artists that, uh, you know, they, they go to these centers and places for a week or a weekend and they get immersed in a type of music, in a, in a style of music. And so those, those uh, are the people that I am constantly inspired by and it's my desire to do uh, a fraction of what they do and, and uh, keep, keep on, you know, performing as a musician and teaching and building community and creating spaces where people can experience music in the same way that I did as a kid. I've enjoyed performing for a number of reasons. I, I think it's, there's a sort of magical thing that happens when you're fully present to, with your bandmates. And you know, with bluegrass music, it's largely improvisatory. And so there's a, a sense of just feeling very connected to the fact that we can express ourselves as freely as we are in the moment. I've been drawn to that. I like the idea of bringing joy to people's lives through performance. I'm really connected to the audience and, and uh, the, the type of energy that that's happens between an artist and a, and a performer. I think both the joy that it brings and also the way that it helps people and myself process uh, difficult feelings as well. I think I'm drawn to that aspect of performance. It's also something that is connected. I When I left public school, I wanted everything I, I did to be connected, and so uh, I was performing in bluegrass bands and, uh, while I was a teacher, but it wasn't the kind of music that I could really dig deep into in the school systems. I would, you know, introduce it, but it was a small portion of, of what, uh, what the school systems are interested in, in teaching and things like that. So, uh, as a performer, I'm also inspired to, to just be an inspiration to others. I, the reason why I, you know, perform today is because I learned from these musicians who were also extremely generous with their time and they were willing to uh, teach uh, young people. I, I was a teenager at the time when I first heard bluegrass and fiddle music and things like that. And, you know, music really outside of the classical world, you know, the classical violin world. And so those, those teacher performers in my life were kind of what, you know, inspired me originally to do what I'm doing now, which is to, to uh, in addition to just perform, to try to inspire people to want to learn the music and be a part of this greater community and, and learn from, uh, from sorts of workshops and camps and things like that that I'm either teaching at or now putting on and organizing.
Well, I mentioned before that my biggest inspiration was were these three people, Christian Howes, Jay Unger, and um, Pete Wernick. And they've all found partnerships with places like the Ashokan Center or Silver Bay. And uh, Christian Howes recently moved to Asheville and he started working with uh, Chris Mount uh, Center. And these are all retreat centers that sometimes are used for corporate events, sometimes they're used for uh, spiritual retreats and things like that. Uh, they're nature preserves, they're just beautiful spaces for people to kind of reconnect with themselves. And they're used for all these different reasons, but these mentors of mine have uh, built partnerships with those places to uh, create spaces for people to be immersed in a style of music, whether it be bluegrass or jazz or, or swing music or old time and country music. All these styles of music I had never learned in the school systems. I learned out of these, these retreats that are put on by these heroes and mentors of mine. And so I have a very, very strong vision that I'm committed to in, in trying to, to create a similar legacy and a similar, uh, follow that sort of same vision that these people had. And that a lot of them put on these camps and retreats when they were my age uh, for the first time. And so I, I've done that for, uh, at the Ashokan Center. and um, I've, there's about 50 people coming to uh, to this weekend retreat that I'm putting on in, in January and working to create some more partnerships like that. But my real dream as a lifelong Connecticut resident would be to find someone who sees that vision, someone who is uh, inspired by it in the same way that I am and want to partner in some way to create an Ashokan, cent uh, you know, an Ashokan Center or a retreat center like that in Connecticut. I know those spaces are there. I know there's people, there's retreat centers that are used for spiritual retreats, that are used for corporate retreats, that would be perfect if someone, you know, understood this vision and wanted to form a partnership. So to be able to stay in my home state where every family member, I have a huge family here, I have, you know, my whole history and network and all of my work in the world of, uh, you know, with the Connecticut Bluegrass Association and the, the workshops and jams and all these things that I've done been a lifelong commitment to New England and Connecticut as the epicenter of all of that. And Connecticut is a great place for people to escape out of New York City or out of Boston or come into these, these beautiful spaces that we have and learn music just in the same way that many of my mentors uh, you know, have created spaces. So I'm, I'm really committed to that vision and I think it's very possible. I think the spaces are out there. It's just a matter of time and, and uh, making the right connections. I think that the number one thing I love most about it is, is the community. I, I went to my first bluegrass festival, uh, the Gray Fox Bluegrass Festival, when I was a, a college freshman, the summer of my college freshman year. And uh, I just absolutely fell in love with the fact that people at these festivals, unlike any other music festival, they're not just there to hear the music. In fact, I would often go to these festivals and never pay any attention to the, the performers on stage. I would just go there to hang out, play music, sing songs, and uh, have a great time with people. People go to these festivals and they get there four days early just to camp in the sun and play music together. So the biggest aspect that draws me to bluegrass music is the community that's built into it. People get together, they don't have to be a pro musician, they could, they could be playing guitar for three weeks and they could know enough music to participate in these kind of communal activities. Just, just this weekend I hosted a, uh, a potluck kind of bluegrass jamming party and we had you know 25 or so people that just came and filled out the house filled out every room playing music that's something I don't see in other genres and it's my favorite aspect of it but there's other things of course drawn I played classical violin growing up in, in school and and I also loved singing in choirs and, and in musicals and I've always been a part of you know, acapella groups and things like that something that's that's uh, always been a draw for me. So bluegrass music being this, this vocal-centric genre, it's kind of based in, in vocal harmony singing, really influenced by blues and, and, and also church hymnal singing, and, you know, three and four part harmony singing, people singing together is a big part of it. Uh, it was the, where the world of, you know, violin, now fiddle, you know, has collided with singing. And of course, the other aspect of it, it's, it's an American genre, just like jazz. Many people up here are more familiar with jazz because it's, you know, epicenter has, for a long period of time has been, you know, New York City. And bluegrass music has had its epicenter in, you know, places like Kentucky, Virginia. And so it's just a different culture, but it's just as much as an American music style as, as jazz music, and we can claim it in the same way. 
Uh, it has that improvisational aspect, the blues, the soul aspect that, that we love in, in American music. And that aspect is something I've really connected to as an artist and, and a, a creative person as well. My name is Amanda Hanslick. I live in Storrs, Connecticut. I'm originally from Iowa and moved to Connecticut about 15 years ago. I am the choral director at E.O. Smith High School there in Storrs, and I've been there for about 12 years. Before that, I worked at the University of Connecticut uh, directing children's choirs and teaching music education courses. And prior to that, I was an elementary school general music teacher. Uh, when I was living in New York. And I volunteer a lot within my discipline, within the choral community, and I'm involved with the Connecticut Music Educators Association, and I'll be entering my term as president for the American Choral Directors Association for our eastern region, which is comprised of 11 states along the eastern seaboard, like this summer. So I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, so I balance my life with a lot of volunteer and service, but also just daily teaching and making music with my students in stores. I'm always, always inspired by my students, clearly. I love being with them. I love teaching high school. Uh, you know, it's, it's a really magical process to engage with students over a four-year period, from the age of 14 to the age of 18. The way they embrace change and the wild development that they go through musically and personally and artistically during that time. I'm always inspired by the way they are willing to take risks and to evolve, and that's really inspiring to me. I'm also really inspired just by my colleagues, by other music educators, in the world who are, <laughs> honestly, I think, doing the most noble job that there is and creating art with kids on a daily basis in, you know, so many dimensions. And I'm continually inspired by other arts educators all the time. Being a hero is kind of multidimensional, right? I don't think that you can be a hero within a discipline necessarily or for other people until you're a hero inside of yourself. Um, I think being a hero is about courage and taking risks and saying what needs to be said, uh, doing what needs to be done for yourself so you can then do it for others. I was thinking about this concept of a hero, <laughs> you know, obviously personally, but then in a more broad sense. And, you know, okay, <laughs> so Mariah Carey says, a hero lies in you. It's true. A hero lies in you. And then you take that courage and you go into the world. And for all of us as arts heroes, it is our, it's our duty to reflect society. It's our duty to not just bring joy and comfort and entertainment, but to elevate real life, to elevate what's happening in the world, to bring awareness and depth to what is actually happening in society through the mediums that we engage with. And I think that's what being a hero is. In our disciplines, stepping into our art form, and taking it into the places that need evolution, that need light, that need, that need joy. That's, that's being a hero. You know, I can speak to music teachers, right? But really it's for all artists, is that we know that we're not alone. That's my biggest dream is that music educators and artists seek each other out, that we don't ever feel siloed into our own creation or into our own artistic disciplines, that we 
continue to find each other, to engage with each other, to take the risk and the, make, you know, make those connections and have the courage to really see each other and celebrate each other and never feel competition or any, you know, hint of imposter syndrome, right? That we, that we shouldn't do it alone and that we need each other and when we're together, like it's limitless what, what art can do and how far it can reach. And that's my biggest dream. Artists are not alone and, and we need each other. My name is Phil Michalowski from New London, Connecticut. I am here, I believe, because of my 35-year career with the Guard Arts Center. I've been a volunteer in a variety of capacities uh, with, with the Guard from its uh, kind of inception as a nonprofit in the late 80s uh, up to the, the current time. I believe I was uh, initially asked to, to get involved with the Guard because of my professional career as a city planner and economic development consultant, I uh, uh, had a lot of relationship to the art, Performing Arts Center as a, uh, as a stimulator of, of economic development within the city of New London. And being a local resident, it uh, uh, was something that, that appealed to me. Um, the, uh, so we've been with the transition of the Arts Center from, uh, from basically a, a building that was, in, uh, was being threatened with demolition uh, uh, to, uh, to a pretty magnificent uh, performing arts center uh, movie palace that it is today. Uh, kind of the steps were uh, the initial planning for uh, utilization of, of the facility uh, and then uh, uh, taking creating a new front of the house. Uh, the guard had been just a, a movie theater in basically an office and retail building and uh, the transformation to a, to a performing arts center where a front of the house was necessary uh, that was that was the initial effort and from that it involved acquiring uh, basically the balance of the block that the Guard Art Center uh, sits on and tying those buildings into the operation of the theater uh, and trying to create a number of smaller spaces that could be used to, uh, uh, to bring in smaller uh, community groups and the like. Um, so that's in kind of an overview to, to today's today's efforts still are involved in uh, upgrading the theater. It's been a it's been a 35-year incremental process, uh, but I think we've made uh, great progress and uh, probably all culminated in uh, last year's award by the, the League of American Historic Theaters. Uh, Guard was, uh, was, was nominated as the uh, outstanding historic, uh, uh, historic theater in America, so we take great pride in that, that accomplishment. The arts provide that uh, lift to the human spirit that uh, is important uh, to all of us. Uh, uh, those who have the talent who are able to see in a, uh, in a much deeper way in, uh, in, in music, in, uh, uh, in performance, in, uh, in sculpture, in dance, and the like, uh, uh, it, uh, it needs a venue in which to to present those those activities and, and give the broader community an opportunity to uh, uh, to uh, to appreciate to learn to come together, uh, so those are all kinds of functions of the art center that we 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 cherish. When when I was first told, I was a little taken aback because I am I am far from an artist. Uh, you know, I've, I've been a volunteer, 
we've worked uh, for for uh, you know, on on the board board of trustees level uh, for for all this. I had been the, the guard president for for 17 years, so that's that's far removed from what happens in the building on stage with professional staff uh, and the like. But uh, I guess it's important in that I, uh, the state has not recognized tr trustees, the volunteer trustees that that make so many non art, art nonprofits uh, really function within within this state. Uh, people need to step up, get involved, and support the things that they're uh, that they're passionate about, or they uh, they tend to wither and, and disappear. So. Uh, it's, an, it's an important function, and uh, if some recognition uh, helps the cause uh, and gets others to step up and become involved, then it's well worth the effort. I think it's been the focus on the mission of, of what the Performing Arts Center kind of does and what it means in the community. It's, uh, it's, I've been I've been fortunate to have uh, met so many different people at uh, you know, th throughout age age groups who, uh, who who have had great experiences and important experiences because they came they came to the theater you know as kids going to say a movie uh, to uh, a, a lot of uh, younger kids going to. Um, uh, our summer, our summer on stage. Uh, we'll go to uh, the uh, the youth uh, uh, showtime performances that are there. Uh, very uh, very successful uh, uh, youth talent show, which which reached out uh, in, in, into the broader region and uh, and uh, and transformed some lives because of that experience. Uh, that shows the what the arts can do to. Uh, to light fire in uh, in people and uh, and and, uh, and have them you know kind of be all they can be uh, and, and so that's that that's a, that's an element that I think we, we should all be appreciative of. <laughs> Is to have the arts more integrated into. Uh, and into the fabric of, of the of the communities of this state. This, this state has tremendous amount of of creative creative people, uh, and you know it has since its founding. And and the arts are a way to, to focus that. You know, rather than look at art as as an entertainment or a side. Uh, uh, activity it, it, it needs to be appreciated as a more central activity it's clear uh, as an economic uh, uh, generator in communities how important it is it is it, I think it's it's proven uh, uh, as, as an important component of central cities of, of this state um, and um, you know that that needs to continue to be uh, recognized supported and uh, it, it'll continue to do uh, important good work uh, to add to the cohesiveness of communities and, uh, and uh, the quality of life of, uh, of Connecticut going forward. Make some noise if you're still here and you're still loving it. Love to hear the voices. And this is what we really wanted to do with this event, give our awardees an opportunity to just speak from their heart. Sometimes we get into spaces where we have to prepare speeches, but this is a human space and we want to be human. And with humanity comes some more music. So ladies and gentlemen, and everyone else, Put your hands together once again for the Dwayne Keith Project.
have been doing this Arts Awards, formerly known as the Arts Hero Awards, since 2016. And this year we're introducing a new award. And so at this time, I'd like my emerging creative awardees to make their way right to that exit sign so you can get up on stage so we can acknowledge you and honor you. So my emerging creatives, make your way, make your way. And to tell you more about this exciting new award, our awardees, and why this is so important to us. Please welcome to the stage, Tekoa and Liz. Good evening, everybody. How are you guys doing so far? My name is Tekoa Omaro Tunu, and I'm the Arts Education Manager for the Connecticut Office of the Arts. Thank you all so much for being here with us tonight to celebrate these vibrant artists. This year, as Colton mentioned, we've decided to add an emerging creative category to our awards to shine a light on early career creatives making waves across the state. The artists we are honoring today are bold and brave leaders. They are innovative in their approach to their work, have a deep impact on their communities, and this is only the beginning for them. This year, our emerging creatives are Jasmine Jones, Francis Pollock, and Mateen Malikzada. Jasmine? Yeah, let's give it up again. Jasmine Jones is a photographer and curator who has single-handedly run a Magazine for the past five years. She uses her magazine to highlight art, artists, and Connecticut in the best light. Frances Pollock 
is a first composer whose work has been programmed by festivals and opera companies across the United States. She is currently a doctoral candidate at the Yale School of Music. Francis is one of the visionaries and the CEO of Midnight Oil Collective, a venture studio that incubates, accelerates, and invests in art and entertainment. To date, Midnight Oil Collective has invested in 10 arts and entertainment ventures and has created jobs for over 300 artists. Mateen is a seventh generation potter from Afghanistan. Mateen and his family arrived in the US in 2022 after having escaped the Taliban. He carries with him a unique centuries old artistic tradition and is a master craftsman, now offering his art to the people of Connecticut. Please join me in welcoming and celebrating the emerging creators of 2023. There he is. Everyone give it up for Mateen. He's making his way to the stage. Here we go, Mateen. And when he comes back on, you gotta make noise again. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Thank you all so much for showing them love now. Sometimes we wait for later to give people their flowers, but we want to acknowledge them now. Who you're looking at on the stage are representations of not what's next, but what's now. So let's nurture them, let's cultivate, let's inspire each other, and take care of the talent and the beauty and the innovation that's right here in Connecticut. And we encourage you, uh, there's a QR code in the lobby as well as you can go on our website. You can read more about all of our awardees, including our emerging creatives, as we celebrate them, but also see how you can stay connected with them and continue to support their work. And they're three of many who are out here doing incredible work within the state. So let's celebrate one more time, make some noise. Are you feeling inspired yet? Are you feeling energized yet? All right, that was okay. Are you, are you, are you okay? All right, I'm just making sure. I'm having a great time, so I hope that you do as well. And so we're rounding out to our last batch of Arts Hero awardees, and we wanna give them our hearts and our attention and feed off of the beauty of their experiences, their stories, and their dreams. Hi, I'm Gabby Barnes, a She's a free art supply trading post for everyone in Connecticut. It's values aligned. Um, that's the shortest answer I can give you. Um, I believe that all of us are creative. I believe that resources are abundant. And I believe that sharing those resources among one another is how we build community, learn, and take care of each other. Um, and so, I do this work because I believe those things and this work is that embodied for me. It's less of a human <laughs> and um, more of an entity. I am inspired by the, the planet. I think that Earth is 
a work of art. I think every day there's something beautiful to behold, to experience, to witness, and um, you know, slowing down and, and taking a moment to um, to be a part of that, um, to witness that, to experience that um, is is inspiring. So I would say Earth is my biggest inspiration. <laughs> You know, I'm a librarian, and so books are usually like where my brain goes. Um, and when I think of the word hero, I immediately am drawn to fairy tales and princesses and princes. And um, heroes feel the, the, the term, it fe they feel fake. Like, um, you know, heroes wear, wear capes, and heroes fly, and heroes have superpowers. Um, but in reality, heroes are just, you know, I think we all have moments on a day-to-day -day basis where we have the opportunity to be a hero for someone. Um, and oftentimes it's not as large as we expect it to be. Sometimes it's just we said something that changed the course of someone's day. More funding. <laughs> Um, and more funding I think that would be monumental. I think we would really activate the creativity that is pulsating underground um, and give it the backing that it truly needs. I, there are so many things that I would love to see in the art scene in Connecticut, um, but I think that money is the driving force and, and paying individuals to do the beautiful work that they are talented and, and competent enough to do is where it starts. My community, the people who I love and who love me, um, I think it's really easy when things get tough to want to insulate, isolate, run away, and I find running towards community and allowing community to show up for you is one of the most incredible ways to feel loved and to turn everything around. <laughs> I'm Suzanne Gaskell. I live in my Connecticut. I recently retired. I enjoyed a 29-year tenure teaching art at Daniel Hand High School in Madison, Connecticut. And I also serve on the board at Gilead Community Services, which is a nonprofit, uh, mental health nonprofit in Middletown, Connecticut. Well, uh, you know, I started teaching art. Uh, I love art. I love uh, sharing it uh, with others. And uh, during the course of my art career, I began to realize that um, art is so transformative. It acts as an agent of change, not only on an individual level as you're creating, um, but also it has the ability, because it transcends language, to, to communicate more broadly. Um, it can raise social consciousness, and I became particularly interested in uh, working with students and creating work myself to um, advocate for various um, social causes. Um, one cause that was quite dear to me was um, mental health. I had a, um, a son who uh, was diagnosed with a severe mental health issue when he was in his early 20s. Uh, and over the course of the last 20 years, I became involved with an amazing group of people at Gilead Community Services. And um, I was able, I was very fortunate, you know, working with high school students who uh, shared my passions. And um, we did a large uh, group art show at the state capitol uh, two years ago to help um, affect change and create broader access to mental health care. I have 
so many people who've inspired me on both an individual and an artistic level. Um, on an artistic level, most recently, I was very inspired by a woman named Ellen Frank, who was an artist and visionary who founded uh, Cities of Peace. She worked with a lot of um, people post-conflict to come together to create these just magnificent works of art. Uh, I shared her work with my students during COVID. I had the good fortune to work with Ellen Frank on a uh, project called The Breathing Project, which pulled in um, a number of uh, participants on a global level when we had a show in Brooklyn, New York, um, two years ago. Uh, and on the, uh, with Gilead Community Services that I mentioned, um, the nonprofit, I've just been so inspired by both the clients there and the people that work there. Um, the clients, many of them, my son included, are really struggling with um, significant mental health issues and uh, to see them work towards recovery and the hope they have for the future and um, in spite of some serious obstacles has been really remarkable and I'm really impressed with the people at Gilead in terms of their compassion, their patience, which is extraordinary because that mental health journey is not a linear one. There's oftentimes setbacks and I've just um, really been in awe what they do on a daily basis. Oh, for me, and I think for um, my students as well, you know, I can think about COVID in particular. Uh, I think art is a way that we just kind of can pull into ourselves. Um, and it's very therapeutic on one level. Um, as I mentioned before, I think that because it transcends language and you have an ability to connect with a, a broad audience. In spite of the fact that it's such an intensely personal journey, I think you also um, tap into some truisms that you know we all experience. And uh, I just would like to see if we could all tap into all of us finding the artist within, you know, without trying to sound naive, I would like to see that uh, we, you know, celebrate the richness of the diversity of cultures and, um, you know, that creative energy as opposed to destroying it. And I think the world would be a lot better place. As an arts educator, I certainly would love to see greater access to the arts, not only in our schools, but um, with uh, other local nonprofits, et cetera. I think um, art is so integral to um, developing a full person and it, it helps us think more critically. And as mentioned, I think it also opens our eyes to um, you know, celebrating diversity, but also understanding what is universal about all of us. And I think art is the vehicle that makes that happen and um, it just makes for a much richer life regardless of whether you're actually practicing or enjoying um, the arts, it's, it's life. <laughs> My name is Stephanie Ingracia. I'm from Washington, Connecticut. So about four years ago, my husband and I formed an arts space on our farm. We grow grapes, we make wine, um, and now we have an art space that um, is about bringing the community together. My passion is about bringing artists to the community, um, about opening hearts and minds of people for whom maybe wouldn't necessarily see that kind of art, um, and, and to really change the way people think about the world. I guess we do this because I wanted to bring what I learned in New York, working with arts organizations to my community in Connecticut. Um, we have been in Washington, Connecticut for almost 35 years. 
um, but we're now spending a lot more time there and I thought it would be great to, to bring some of that you know artistic energy to our great little New England town. I think artists inspire me to keep coming back. I always learn something. I always see things in a different way. You know, there are people who collect art who've inspired me over the years um, and really kind of opened my eyes to what it looks like to get to learn about different artists and their practices. And that's what keeps me coming back. Again, it's about, you know, artists sort of teaching us different ways to think about the world. It's, it's opening hearts and minds. It's, you know, bringing different communities together. I love seeing a diverse in age, in political um, bents, in, you know, lots of different ways people think about the world into one space. And our space has always been about bringing art into nature. It's very much, um, you know, uh, it's a wooded area. We built an amphitheater um, with a world-renowned artist who's actually local in our community, Mark Menon. And um, we built this 200-year-old barn. Uh, we have a, an old grain silo that we moved from our farm that's now an artist's installation by Randy Palombo. Um, and it's all those kind of magical spaces that, you know, create awe and wonder for our community. My dream is for our community to keep coming, to keep learning, to be open to different points of view. Um, again, as you mentioned, this it's a fraught time in our world, and I think the more we can um, bring different people together, um, the, the better it is for everybody. That's a very big word, hero. Um, in, our, in my case, um, I think it was about the perseverance of, of bringing this type of work to a community that maybe wasn't ready for it, um, but has now embraced it, and I'm really proud of that. I hope that people will, again, be open to this idea that the world is large. The artists um, who come to Shag have a lot of different expertise, see the world in a lot of different ways, and I hope that our community and our and beyond can learn and feel great about being again with art and nature in a space that's pretty magical. framing the future and so my question to you now is what future do you see and we're so grateful to get to this part because it is the opportunity for us to see the faces in person whose hearts we've bore and those that we've recontextualized maybe our understanding of their stories and how they got to where they are and this award ceremony is so special to us because our process and oftentimes in award spaces, it's really about a committee behind the curtain selecting their favorites or who they think is deserving of this awards. But with us in this context, we decided to create a space where community was centered and we really wanna thank specifically 
our regional partners. We have what are called regional service organizations. Every region in the state has one of these organizations. And in our office, we use a lot of acronyms. So DRSO, everybody say DRSO. DRSO. Okay, oh, amazing, that was so beautiful. <laughs> Uh, and these DRSOs are passionate about serving the region, so it's also an opportunity for us to highlight them because what makes our work strong is what's happening in the roots. And we want our roots to be strong, and that includes you. So we want to encourage you to support the arts heroes, but all of the artists and everyone that makes up our ecosystem. And my personal hope is that what we see in our future is family. Oftentimes we are divided for so many different reasons, but hopefully spaces like this and seeing all the different persons and personalities that make up our beautiful community of artists and creators and thinkers and imagineers. Don't find me Disney. I know that's a <laughs> trademark thing. Uh, don't, tell, don't tell the team. Um, but when we see all of the different types of folks who are making up our space, Hopefully it grounds us in our humanity and helps us think about how we can move forward truly together to pioneer, to innovate, and to dream of a future in which arts are centralized and arts are celebrated and our artists and creators and thinkers can do so in equitable, sustainable ways and we don't have to beg anymore to notice because art is so central to our human experience. So with that, I'd like to invite our presenters and our award winners to make your way up the stage. So there's a sign right here, exit. Don't worry, it's not going to take you out the back door. It's going to bring you up on stage. So let's give it up for our award winners, our presenters. We're going to celebrate them. We're going to party. And we're just happy to be in the room all together because tonight is also an opportunity for us to see one another and to talk and to maybe reach out to someone that you've probably been harassing on email low key. I know, so I saw some of you all avoiding. Some people you're like, oh, there, there, there he is, there he is. But you know, don't avoid, it's okay. Just have one conversation and you never have to send an email back. Uh, I'm just kidding, always respond, always respond. Don't worry, I don't run, I don't run. If you ever email me, I've never run from you. Um, but let's make some noise for our regional service organizations and the representatives who are gonna be here to give out these awards and celebrate our Arts Hero awardees. Don't worry, they're coming. You know, don't, no pressure, you don't have to keep clapping. But once you see them again, you gotta clap. All right. Oh, there you go, there you go, here's your moment. And so each of our arts heroes is being represented and has been nominated and voted on by the regional service organization. And we want to thank the organizational leaders who put together committees within the community to vote on and to discuss based on the criteria how we got to this moment and this point here. So they're a really important part and they have representatives. Some of the members up here are board members of these organizations or just really great folks in the community, so we want to celebrate them as well. So, one more time, let's give it up for our presenters. Oh wow, don't they look amazing? All right, so, we're almost there, I know. Shout out to the team in the back, shout out to the team in the back. Come on, it's magic, it's magic. It's kind of like that moment in a, a graduation ceremony. You hold your applause until the end, and then that one family that still screams out anyway. Um, we do have security team, so you will be escorted out. So don't do it, and don't test me. All right, are we, are we there? I can't count. We got, is this it? Is everyone? All right, perfect. So now this time, you all have been so amazing about showing love and making noise, but this is a time where I need everybody on 150. All right, so first up, let's make some noise for Marcella. We're being presented the award by the Arts Council of Greater New Haven, Susan Clinner.
Yeah, there you go. 150. All right, who we got next? Let's give it up for Deborah. Being presented this award by the Arts and Cultural Collaborative of Waterbury. The, uh, the executive director, Diane Plop, is not able to join us, so she's been given this award by our very own Tekla Amara Utu. Give it up for Dubian Montoya. Being presented this award by the Cultural Alliance of Fairfield County Executive Director Erica Wesley. Give it up for Austin. Make some noise for Austin. And Austin is being presented this award by the Cultural Alliance of Western Connecticut Executive Director Lisa Scales could not be with us, but here we have Don presenting the award on their behalf. Y'all are doing great. Keep it up. Keep it up. All right, let's give it up for Amanda, y'all. <laughs> Wendy Vincent, Executive Director of the Cultural Coalition, representing the Northeastern part of Connecticut. Let's give it up one more time for Amanda. <laughs> let's give it up for Philip, New London, in the house being presented once again by Wendy Vincent from the Cultural Coalition for the Southeastern part of Connecticut. Did you get it? All right, cool. Oh, oh, whoa, whoa, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm kidding, show the love. Let's go, let's go, Gabby Barr. Presented on behalf of the Greater Hartford Arts Council, Amanda Roy. Yeah. All right, let's give it up for Stephanie. Presented this award by the Northwest Connecticut Arts Council Executive Director Seth Burley. You cannot be with us to present, but Cindy is doing it on your behalf. Yes. Let's give it up for Suzanne. Let's give it up. Presented this award by the Shoreline Arts Alliance Executive Director Eric Dillner. But right here, Andrew Wood, board member, is presenting on their behalf. So let's take a photo and give it up for them. Alright, so now, if all of our awardees and presenters can come a little bit closer and huddle up, we're going to do a group photo. And one more time, let's stand to our feet now, if you can, and let's celebrate our awardees. Connecticut Arts Bureau awardees, instead of celebrating while we're here. So wait, hold on, sorry, sorry. Miscommunication. Don't come forward, step back. I guess you're too close, it's my fault. So step back just a little bit, so he can't get everybody. Two, how many steps, two, four? Five, okay, five our photographer says. Give us a thumbs up, are they good? Or keep moving until he says good. Beautiful. 
one more time our beautiful award winners. And one more time, we want to give it up once again for our three Emerging Creative Awardees. And so now, what we want to do is we want to sit for just one more moment, and we're going to welcome one more time to the stage the Dwayne Keith Project. So let's enjoy one more song, and then after that, we're going to get up, we're going to mix, we're going to mingle, and we're going to get to know each other a little bit more. But let's keep the love, let's keep the grace, let's keep the, create, the creative energy, and let's not stop. We got a lot more to do, we got a lot of work to do to make this thing go, but you all are a part of it. So let's enjoy this performance, and let's enjoy each other's company. Thank you so much.
y'all make some noise for yourselves. Thank you for celebrating with us. Dwayne, play us out. Let's celebrate, let's love each other. See you on the next go round. Make sure you stay tapped in and tuned into everything. Give somebody a hug, tell them you love them, and let's keep the creativity flowing. Thank you and have a great night.
you're in here, so clap your hands. Everybody clap your hands if you're in the building. Clap your hands if you're here.
Project.